Sacred Heart is delighted to welcome home Margaret Brennan, a 1998 graduate of Convent of the Sacred Heart. As a student in our upper school, Margaret became <laughs> interested in foreign affairs and joined Model United Nations. Margaret credits her Sacred Heart education with giving her the conviction of my own opinions and the confidence to think analytically and voice opinions and put myself out there. She was a foreign affairs and Middle East studies double major at the University of Virginia, where she earned a bachelor's degree with a minor in Arabic. As a Fulbright Hayes scholar, she studied Arabic at Yarmouk University in Erbid, Jordan. She thought she might enter the foreign service, but a summer internship with CNN pointed her toward a career in journalism. Since joining CBS News in July 2012, Margaret's foreign policy reporting has taken her around the world, primarily assigned to the State Department. She's traveled with the Secretary of State John Kerry and Hillary Clinton to cover national security and diplomatic issues. She was among the first reporters to interview Kerry on the landmark agreement with Iran to freeze its nuclear program and covered the diplomatic breakthrough deal to have Syria transfer control of its chemical weapons. Margaret was one of the first reporters to interview Hillary Clinton about the fatal attack on the U.S. mission in Benghazi, Libya. She also traveled with Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel in Afghanistan and interviewed him about the U.S. decision to withdraw forces from America's longest war. Looking back to Sacred Heart, she says her experience continues to inform her values today. She says, I think about that adage we hear so often at Sacred Heart. Those to whom much is given, much is expected. Ms. Brennan, please join me at the podium. so much. Congratulations, ladies. This is uh, such a proud moment to be standing up here looking at your parents, and I want all of you as well to thank them today for sending you here. Thank you, parents. Um, and of course, thank all the faculty as well for all the work they've put in uh, for you for these past few years. Um, it is great to be back here in Greenwich uh, at Sacred Heart and to see how much this school has grown since I graduated back in 1998, which sounds like a really long time right now. <laughs> um, and I'm feeling quite adult as I say that, and I'm not really sure what to do with it. Um, but I gotta say, this school, not only was my graduating class just 26 girls, um, so the scale has grown, but when you walk around, these grounds are unbelievably uh, massive and gorgeous. And I'm just, I'm so proud of this community um, because it seems to still have that sense of intimacy that was here when it was so much smaller. Um, but it also gives you a sense, knowing that I was in a class of 26 girls, how much culture shock I went through when I began my first year at the University of Virginia, where they really measure the student body in the thousands and not by first names. Um, I know there are two girls that are going to UVA, I heard, somewhere out here. Come say hi, please, later. Wahua. <laughs> Um, ever since I was asked to speak here at commencement by Pam Hayes, I've been thinking about what I would tell all of you in this huge transition point in your lives. And I realized that most of the advice that I really want to give 18-year-old girls going to college is not something to be said from a podium during a commencement address, <laughs> and certainly not at Sacred Heart. So please come and find me later. Um, but I, I do have a few things I want you all to be mindful of as you head off. Um, you likely cannot fully appreciate what an amazing, nice cocoon you have been in at Sacred Heart, particularly during these last four years of high school. I really believe that my parents gave me a tremendous gift by putting me in a community where I was noticed and where integrity, compassion, and spirituality are celebrated because a lot of you are going to be searching for those things when you get out there, not only in school, but when you get out there in the workforce. And you're going to look back and realize what you had inside these gates. 
Uh, for me, Virginia was a big adjustment from Sacred Heart, not just because of its size, um, but then I moved to Manhattan after that. I started a career in broadcast journalism. First, I covered the financial world. Then, three years ago, I moved to Washington to take the job at CBS News. And that's where I am now, covering foreign policy. So that means I spend a lot of time on airplanes, chasing around decision makers and asking questions for a living. And as a colleague of mine says, Journalists have the responsibility of writing that first draft of history, and I work very hard to get that right. Sometimes my job simply means trying to craft the right question, because at certain moments, the inquiry itself can be powerful. And the reality of that became clear to me about two years ago on the eve of what looked to be those impending US-led airstrikes on Syria to destroy what remained of the Assad regime's chemical weapons stockpile. I'm sure so many of you remember those absolutely horrific images on the newscast of what happened on August night in 2013, when around 1,500 civilians, including 426 children, were gassed to death in a Damascus suburb. The crime was undeniable. A rhetorical red line set by President Obama had been crossed. And I want to remind you that that red line was publicly shared when a reporter asked a question at a news conference. Come back to that question idea for you. Secretary of State John Kerry was dispatched to the Middle East and to Europe to try to build support for this limited military response. And back in Washington, President Obama surprised many people, including some of these allies who had already supported the attack, by deciding to defer to Congress to approve the action. So all of that we knew was going to be a really tough sell. And my fellow reporters and I started wondering whether or not the administration was going to go through with the strikes. Something didn't seem right. There were urgent meetings underway in Moscow. There was skittishness back home. And I knew that Syrian President Bashar al-Assad had decided to grant his very first interview in a very long time to one of my colleagues, Charlie Rose. So there was a sense that there were these signals being sent, and no one was really sure what it all meant. So at a press conference in London, I asked Secretary Kerry whether there was any way for Assad to avoid US strikes. And he said yes. And it shocked us, all of us. We scrambled. Uh, minutes later, his spokespeople dismissed the comments as a rhetorical flourish, but within a matter of hours, the Russian foreign minister had floated a proposal for a diplomatic deal, followed by President Obama saying he was actually exploring the possibility. And one week later, I was back in Europe with Secretary Kerry as he hammered out that, that landmark agreement to force Syria to give up its stockpile. And the airstrikes, as you all know, were called off. The reason I share this story with you is to show you the power of asking a question sometimes the most simple one, at the right time. And I want you to remember that as you head into these next classrooms that aren't going to be as insular, they're not going to be as intimate, but you need to make sure you raise your hands and you need to continue doing that. And I often think back to an experience I had in a Sacred Heart classroom. You know, these planes did this when I was here too. And there was this huge fight for so long to get that, and I guess, I guess I didn't go the way we wanted it. But <laughs> there's one classroom experience I think back to uh, quite often here at Sacred Heart. And I thought of it a lot at press conferences. It was in an English class taught by Sister Cherry during my junior or my senior year. I can't remember which one. And for those of you who might not know her, perhaps some of you in the audience did have her as a teacher. I know she's now living out in California, but really all you need to know about Sister Cherry is that she did not suffer fools gladly, and she had a very unique way of getting at the heart of the matter. And I remember her asking for opinions on whichever book we were discussing at the time, and a few girls raised their hands. Each started their sentences with, well, I don't know if this is right, but this could be wrong, but maybe this is just me, but and Sister Cherry cut them off really sharply, saying, if you don't have the courage of your own conviction, then don't bother raising your hand. Ouch. <laughs> but I have to tell you, that sentence was such 
a gift, because I have thought of it at classroom locations, massive lecture halls at UVA. I've thought of that at press conferences. And it's one of those things that has really, I know, helped motivate me, like, wait, yeah, I am raising my hand and I am going to be in this. And I think about that and that time at Sacred Heart, because it gets to that lesson that we all needed to learn. Don't undercut your own legitimacy by offering people a chance to doubt you before you have even finished your sentence. Words matter. And inserting a disclaimer up front is one of those odd conventions that many women adopt, perhaps unconsciously, to make ourselves seem less threatening or less brash. Don't do that. If you're going to be in the game, be fully present. You have had such a wonderful support network here at Sacred Heart and at home with your families. But as you go out into the world, you will find that while you are busy trying to figure out just who you are, other people will have already decided for you, and they will project those assumptions. Never let others define you. Define yourselves. And I'm not telling you that as some sort of cheesy girl power mantra. In fact, I would have rolled my eyes sitting in these seats listening to somebody like me saying something like that. And I know that my mom has told me that when I was 18, I did a heck of a lot of eye rolling. But, I, you know, to give you a sense, personally, I agree with the comedian uh, Sarah Silverman and her view on this issue where y you don't tell girls they can be anything they want when they grow up because it never would have occurred to them that they couldn't. And you don't need me to tell you what's possible. But what I didn't realize till I get out in the world is how much of that confidence came from my parents and from their support and their choice to put me in a place like Sacred Heart where the expectations were always high. So that's it for the platitudes that I'm gonna recite to you. But I do have a few lessons that I've learned that I think are worth sharing. Get as close as you can to the truth. Personal contact will always trump email or text, and that applies not just for work and the work I do, but also for your personal relationships. It is harder to get a sense of truth when you can't hear the tone, the tenor, inflection, or see someone's facial expression. Context is important and first-person experience is invaluable. Filters can distort or change the meaning. You shouldn't just text your parents or email your professor or whomever it else that you're dealing with. Pick up the phone and make the point to see the person whenever possible. It will help you with the next job. It will help you with your professor. It will help you with your boyfriend, with your girlfriend, with whatever stage you are in life. Please, my next lesson, travel. Please do it as often as you can and go as far as you can. Most Americans travel with their television sets and not with their passports. Statistically, that is fact. Please make it false. You are young and you can get outside the bubble. You'll go to Europe when you're old and you're rich and you can live the high life and really enjoy the good bits of it. But right now, Go to Africa, go to the Middle East, go to Asia, parts of the world that take a little longer and might take a little bit more out of you to get there. But they've got a lot to give back. But please be careful because I don't want to end up having to report on you. <laughs> Learn a language while you're doing all this. Use the next four years to soak up as much knowledge as you can. Make a language part of your education, not just an academic requirement because you'll gain a skill that will help connect you to the wider world. One of the most rewarding and challenging things that I did as a student was to study Arabic in Jordan one summer. And cultural immersion is something that everyone should experience because there is something so humanizing about just struggling to communicate even the most basic thought and functioning outside of your comfort level. All of that's gonna make you grow, and I beg you, study abroad, travel, do it somehow, and soak up the language. Be decisive. Not making a decision is itself a decision, and splitting the difference only gets you halfway there. That goes for relationships, that goes for work, studies, basically anything and everything. 
there is a lot of gray out there. Things are very rarely black and white, clear-cut choices, but that doesn't mean that you get to avoid them. You've made one big decision already, and that's where you're going to go study for the next four years. Not everything will be as clear-cut. But I warn you, be thoughtful, be deliberate, but be decisive. Don't let circumstances rule you. Make clear choices. And your mental health is as important as your physical. We spend so much time, so much effort, so much money trying to perfect and sculpt our physical selves, and it's important. But you must be just as vigilant in preserving your mental and emotional well-being. Because where your mind is, your body will follow. Vent to your friends, talk to your family, and share your experiences. It's going to be stressful. You're going to have a big adjustment when you go to college and when you get out of it. So ask for help and make sure that you offer it when you notice a friend in emotional distress. I can't tell you how many times this has hit home for me that people aren't aware of where their mind is and they see their body quickly follow. I thought of a lot when I was covering the Newtown School shootings here in Connecticut. <laughs> Take momentary mental health checks and do not ignore anxiety, trauma, any kind of emotional duress. The next few years are gonna be stressful, but worry, worry a lot less about making the right move and worry more about being in the right mind. And lastly, Follow the spark. Some of you may know what you want to major in at university, and some of you may not. You got some time. I had a singular focus when I went to UVA, and that was to study international relations in the Middle East. I was, and I continue to be, a total geek. I loved those Maudie Wen trips that Pam Hayes mentioned, and Mrs. Collins took us on them. Um, and that kind of sparked something on, in me when I was here at Sacred Heart. I got excited about National History Day competitions. And I love doing theater. That actually helped me get used to speaking publicly. All these little things, these little moments, these little things you enjoy are part of that spark. I had no idea what all of that was going to add up to. But I knew what made me passionate. I knew that when I performed best, when I followed the thing that excited me the most, it led to success. So you will be faced with a lot of decisions that are gonna come your way that seem to be choices between what's best for you and what you love the best. Follow that spark. It'll be the best path to success. And along the way, don't forget to be honest, be tough, be fair, and be kind. Good luck to all of you. Good luck, class. Thank you, Margaret, for your very inspirational words.